Hello and welcome. You're listening to Law and Legend, produced by Rick Scott and Sebastian O'Dell. Law and Legend brings you myths, legends and fables from the world of folklore and mythology. We're telling stories the way that they're meant to be told, in the style of traditional storytelling and enriched with traditional music and dramatic audio work. This series of Law and Legend is called The Gates of Dream, exploring tales of encounters between the heroines and heroes of Greek myth and the gods and the spirits of the Greek underworld, the lands of dream, death, darkest fate. This episode comes to you thanks to the contributions of our Patreon subscribers, story folk Sean Powell, Christy Carson, Shawnee Basket and Paul Jackson. Please consider joining our heroic patrons and supporting the podcast by becoming a subscriber. Visit our website and click on support us for more details. In this, our ninth episode, several generations of a single family are caught in a bloody cycle of violence driven by the furies which haunt their dreams. From storyteller Sebastian O'Dell and featuring the music of Michael Levy and Sakilo, this is The Birth of Serpents. And so it was that King Odysseus and his loyal men took up residence in a fortress that lay high in the rocky mountains of Ithaca. They made an altar there to Athena, and they slaughtered many goats and oxen, so the smoke of the sacrifices rose from the peaks into the air, and the scent of roasted flesh and charred bones drifted down through the canyons to the hills beyond. Day after day, Odysseus sat in his high chamber, making devotions to the goddess, and day after day, His lieutenants and spies went up and down the roads, bringing him reports from all over the kingdom. After many months had passed, the agents brought news. An armed band of raiders had landed on the coast. Odysseus' soldiers fought them in the harbour and in the fields, but there were a great many of them, and they could not all be held back. And word reached them that the leader of the raiding party was looking for the king. Odysseus said, we will remain here. They will hear I am up in the mountains, and sooner or later they will find me. But the march will be hard, and we are entrenched in this fortress. And those winding mountain paths will give us every opportunity we need to ambush them. So we will wait, and we will be ready. Then the king asked if anyone had laid eyes on the leader of those raiders, if it was indeed Telemachus who sought him out, but no man could confirm it. The next night, word came that the invaders had crossed into the mountains and were on their way to the fortress. The king could not sleep. Instead, he sat before his fire, contemplating the flames. Two serving boys came in and out of his chamber, bearing food and letters and basins. He ordered one of them to bring his fine armour, his shield and his sword, and to lay them out by the side of his bed. And when that boy had left, out of his contemplation, Odysseus spoke to the other. Athena is silent, he said. She doesn't answer me. I'm not even sure if she even hears me anymore. The serving boy gazed at the king with luminous eyes. When he answered, his voice was clear and bright. Surely, good master, that cannot be. The gods hear everything. But Odysseus shook his head. The story that my son told me was a prophecy. It teaches that we cannot escape what the gods decree. And if we try, they will turn their heads away from us. I cry out for the goddess to change my fate. And so she turns from me. The son will kill the father. Or the father will kill the son. But the boy said, Do the gods not know love or mercy? Please, my king, keep faith. Athena defends those that she loves. Was it not her wisdom and compassion that saved the boy Orestes? the son of Agamemnon. For they say that Athena washed the blood from his hands, even though, as the story tells, 
the Furies themselves were chasing him to the ends of the earth. This tale begins as the ships were finally returning to Mycenae's harbour. For ten long years the city had waited. Waited for the joy, the glory of triumph. Or for the grief of defeat, and perhaps the trials of retribution. Pain and uncertainty had stalked the streets of the city. And then the beacon fires had sprung up across the mountain tops. Troy had fallen, and our kings had sacked it. King Agamemnon had accomplished an impossible feat, breaking the walls of Troy and pillaging Priam's great city. Noble, victorious Agamemnon had showered our heroes in glory. He stood above all other men surveying humanity as only a god could. And now the ships were returning. Even before they landed, Queen Clytemnestra ordered the sacrifices to begin and the ritual smoke to cloud the skies to welcome their heroes home. The king had brought glory to his city and his house. Yet inside Clytemnestra there was no triumph. No glory or vindication in this moment. There was only the promise of vengeance, long awaited and finally at hand. The vengeance that had been smouldering away inside her for ten long years. Her wait was finally over. Vengeance. It breathed through the walls of Mycenae's palace. It screamed at the prophetess Cassandra when she was dragged in by her new king. Until recently, the princess of a great nation. What could be worse than to be a slave, at the mercy of the man who had slaughtered her people? She learned the answer to that question all at once, when she entered the palace. That house had seen horrors that mankind was not meant to witness, over and over again. Family killing family, violence breeding ever more violence. To some, these were merely unpleasant memories. But such was Cassandra's gift that the truth could not be hidden from her, no matter the lengths that had been taken to bury it. A king slain by his brother and his nephew. Children murdered, cut apart and fed to their father. The horror of these visions forced Cassandra to her knees, and she cried out for them to stop, but they did not stop. Another vision came before her eyes. It was a young girl, dressed up in her finest clothes, in a camp that was filled with soldiers. Beyond that camp was a harbour, and in that harbour there waited hundreds upon hundreds of ships. The great Greek fleet, the ships of all of Greece's kings, together at the port of Aulis. Soon, Cassandra knew, these ships would be the ones that would sail across the sea to Troy, to burn and pillage her home. The girl was Mycenae's princess, Iphigenia, the eldest child of Agamemnon. She had been brought here to be married, wedded to Achilles, the greatest of the Greek heroes. She acted shy, though Cassandra could see that she was hiding a great excitement. She came toward Achilles slowly, meekly through the line of soldiers. And then, as Cassandra watched, the soldiers seized her. They forced her head onto a block. Iphigenia had no idea what was happening. She cried out for her father. And there he was, Agamemnon, who had ordered her to come here. He would not answer. He just turned his face away. It was the last thing that Iphigenia would ever see. Her death was Agamemnon's offering to Artemis. Artemis, who had sent ill winds, 
to keep the ships in port, unable to sail. And as they waited, the armies chafed for war. Something had to be done. The seer had told the king that Artemis could only be appeased by a virgin's sacrifice, and only one that was dear to his heart. So Agamemnon had provided, and right away, the winds began to blow fair once again, just as the seer had foretold. Agamemnon had shown his devotion to the gods, and the fleet could finally sail for war. But here at home, the torment had not ended. The spirits of those slaughtered unjustly do not rest quietly in the earth. Their anguished cries rise up from the ground whirl and eddy around each other until they become one voice, one mighty roar for revenge, whatever the cost. It is from this unholy power that the earth has bound together the Furies, spirits of vengeance who call for the blood of those who have spilled it, who direct the hand of the Avengers, and who will not let them rest until the murderer is slain. Their justice has reigned since the dawn of time, patrolling all of mankind's darkest corners. And left to fester and ferment in this place, their hatred had become a frenzy, an unending drumbeat that pounded through Mycenae's stone walls. Clytemnestra heard that beat. Her own heart ran along to its rhythm. Her handmaidens felt great sympathy for her, for whatever her pain, they knew that as the loyal wife of Agamemnon, she must come to forgive him. And as the dutiful queen of Mycenae, personal strife must be forgotten in the moment of victory, for the city's glory must come first. But Clytemnestra is no loyal wife or dutiful queen. Clytemnestra was a mother, and for the mother of a butchered child, Nothing can be forgiven or forgotten. And in one final vision, Cassandra saw that rage, the rage of the Furies welling up inside the Queen and raising a blade to Agamemnon's throat. And to Cassandra's, to provide two more souls for Mycenae's bloody harvest. In the nearby city of Athens, news of Agamemnon's murder confirmed everything that the populace thought of Mycenae. It might be the most powerful city in Greece, perhaps the world now that Troy had fallen, but in the eyes of Athens, Mycenae was a den of viciousness and spite. Violence could happen anywhere, but the killing of family by family was grotesque. And so, years later, when they heard that Aegisthus, who had seized Agamemnon's throne, had himself been deposed and killed in his turn, this too did nothing to improve Mycenae's savage reputation. Athens instead prided itself on its restraint and sound judgement. Its patron, after all, was Athena, goddess of wisdom. It was into the city of Athens that Orestes ran, the son of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra. He had been here once before, but then he had been a youth, proud like his father, though sullen and brooding. That is not the man that the citizens of Athens saw roaming their streets on this day. This man looked weak and broken, as though part of him had been torn out by force and left only a frantic, shambling madman. He cried out in fear of foes who pursued him, but the Athenians could see no one. He ran up to strangers and clutched their robes, demanding to be taken to the temple of Athena. His sister, Electra, was with him, but nothing she could say would stop him crying and tearing out his hair. People shunned Orestes as he made his way through the streets. They had heard that he was the one who had killed Aegisthus and they wanted nothing to do with that endless cycle of bloody murder. Many said that these two should be sent back to where they came from. 
but then their protectress, the goddess Athena, emerged from her temple, not in the form of a man or a woman, but replete in her own divine glory. Orestes would not be cast out, she declared. He had come to her as a supplicant, and his fate was now in her hands. And she called the Athenians to choose their twelve wisest and most honourable citizens. These men were to meet her at the top of the Areopagus, the hill just beside the site of her temple. These men had no idea why they had been summoned, but the goddess commanded so they would obey. On the rocks at the head of the hill stood Athena, beautiful and regal. Her eyes were sharp and luminous, and she bore her unmistakable air of authority and determination. To her left side were Orestes and Electra. The boy's head was bowed, but his sister stared defiantly ahead at the creatures who were now stood across from her. For on the goddess's right side were a group of fearsome and grotesque appearance. They looked a great deal like women, though with faces contorted in righteous fury. But their hair, like that of the gorgons, was made wholly of snakes, and the same creatures writhed across their bodies. This alone might have terrified the Athenians, but all the worse was the brutality that they were known for, from all the stories the Athenians had heard as children. These were the fury, the wrath of the fallen. The men shuddered and backed away, but Athena commanded them to stay. The furies had not come for them, she said. The murderer that they hounded was this man, Orestes, and they had chased him out of Mycenae, through the towns and cities of Argos, until he had arrived here in Athens, to deliver his fate into Athena's hands. This is the hill of Ares, Athena said, and in this city Ares murdered the son of Poseidon. The sea lord wished to kill him in retribution, but he held back his wrath, for he knew that Ares was the beloved son of Zeus and Hera. Instead, Poseidon brought him up onto this hill to face judgment for his crime. His judges were the twelve gods of Olympus. I have gathered you here, because today we must also judge a murderer. Yet the one whose guilt we judge is not a god, but the human Orestes. So instead of a jury of the gods, he will face a jury of twelve humans, chosen from the city of Athens, the wisest of men. In the person of these twelve, the city and humanity will show its commitment to justice. The Athenians looked at one another in disbelief. All their lives they had trusted the sound judgment of Athena, and where she could not rule, the retribution of the Furies always lurked, inescapable, ruthless. Their two arbiters of justice were before them, and yet it was them who were being asked to cast judgment. Why? No explanation was given, for right away the girl Electra began to implore them. Do not punish my brother, she said, but praise him as the saviour of Mycenae and of our house, the noble house of Atreus. We are the heirs of glorious Agamemnon, who accomplished feats beyond the dreams of any other man, Yet the name of our house was sullied, poisoned by treachery. Agamemnon was betrayed by the woman who should have been his loyal wife, and Aegisthus, that putrid, stay-at-home coward who she took to her bed. And though my brother was exiled, I was forced to live on in that palace under the yoke of my father's killers, until finally my brother returned and like an eagle, rising from the nest of a serpent, our father's spirit rose from his tomb and gave us the strength to take revenge and restore our line. 
When she had finished speaking, the Furies advanced towards Orestes. They drew so close to him that when their serpents hissed, their tongues flicked against his skin. He flinched and drew further into himself. One of the women looked to Electra, and she spoke. The Earth is not interested in the death of the Gisthus. Your brother knows this. He knows why we pursue him, and why we will never let him go. Why is it, Orestes? Will you not tell these people what you did after you left the throne room? with the head of Aegisthus already severed from his body? Orestes did not speak. The Furies turned to the jury of Athenians. Each time a different Fury spoke, but they followed on from one another as if with a single voice. Then we will tell you the tale of what happened that night in the palace of Mycenae. It was dark in the bedchamber where Queen Clytemnestra lay awake. Though it was patently too late to receive guests, Aegisthus had answered the call of a guard to meet a traveller who bore some important news. So now she sat alone, watching the candles as they burned low, seeing the tiny islands of warmth recede, holding off the moment that they flickered out and the palace was sealed once again into tomb-like darkness. This dying light was the worst, Clytemnestra thought. In darkness there is no illusion of warmth and safety to cling to. This weakness, this fear that she felt, was alien to Clytemnestra. She hated it. Since her husband had left home, she had told herself that she would never feel it again never call for her husband to calm her in the dead of night. But the night before this, she had had a nightmare. She was undergoing a painful labor, the worst she had ever experienced. The agony was so great that she thought that she would perish in the labor. Finally, as the birth came, she saw that she had not borne a child, but a vicious serpent instead. And when she brought it to her breast, the snake bared its fangs and bit down into her, spreading its venom through her skin and spilling her blood. It felt so vivid as to be a prophecy, a vision of her own downfall. She had awoken in such a state of delirium that she had begged her handmaids and her daughter to pour libations at the tomb of Agamemnon to ask for his forgiveness. This weakness, it lurked in her soul. It was intolerable. In the face of it, the night felt darker, the shadows longer. Then she began to hear footsteps. And this was when she knew that something was wrong. Those slow, heavy footfalls did not belong to her husband Aegisthus. They had none of his unnecessary eagerness. Instead, someone was striking the floor with grim determination. Whoever was coming this way had a task he did not want, but he was determined to carry it out in any case. She picked up a blade. If this man was so close to her bedchamber, it could only mean that Aegisthus was already dead. Well, let them come, she thought. They would be expecting a helpless woman who they could overpower with ease. They were very sorely mistaken. She did not expect to see her son. Though she hadn't seen him since she and Aegisthus sent him into exile, she knew him at a glance. He was armed and he glared at her as he stalked forward, gripping the knife in his hands for all he was worth. She should have felt rage, but
but all she felt was pity for her son, desperate to do something he could not do. She put her own blade down. You killed him, mother. It was the first words that he had spoken to her in years. After all he did for you, after his great conquest, the honour he brought back to our family. Orestes, do you believe that I cared about your father's victory? Did that give our family back what he had taken from us? Orestes said nothing, but kept advancing slowly. Orestes, you are my child too. You cannot kill me. You are wrong, he said. I am the one from your dream, mother. I am the snake born from you, who will turn and spill your blood upon the ground. The fear, the weakness, tore through Clytemnestra like a knife. How had he heard of her dream? She spoke again, though this time more shakily. I bore the curse of womanhood, Orestes. I watched your father bring home his mistresses and concubines, and all the same I loved him, and I bore him three children, which I loved with all my heart. But then my daughter was taken from me. On the happiest day of her life, the day we were told that she would be a wife. Yes, I killed your father. What else could you ask a mother to do? It was Artemis, Orestes said with tears in his eyes, but the same rage in his voice, who demanded Iphigenia's death. My father did his duty by the will of the gods, just like me. On this last sentence, he looked down, like he was not directing this to her at all. Now anger grew in Clytemnestra's voice. Don't tell me of the gods that demanded my daughter's death. What god demanded that she must live? Did any god swear vengeance and halt the fleet in retribution? Show me that god, and then you will see my piety, my obedience. But Orestes was not listening. He was staring at the knife in his hands as he advanced the last few feet upon his mother. He was murmuring, I will honour you, father. Orestes, Clytemnestra pleaded, and she pulled aside her robe to bare her breast to him. Please remember, Orestes, this is the breast you suckled from. You cannot, must not hurt me. <sighs> you are wrong, he said, and then his blade pierced her heart, and she fell. The Fury finished speaking, and one of her fellows took her place. You killed her, Orestes. You killed your own mother. They now turned to the jury of Athenians. This man is a matricide. His act is against the law of nature. He has blackened his soul, and you all know that such a crime makes him ours to run the sun. It was true. The jury had known this law as long as they had lived. Those who murdered their parents had transgressed against the earth, and the earth could not suffer them to live. They looked to Orestes. He did not deny the charge brought against him. In fact, it seemed to have struck a nerve within him as he was bowed to the floor once again, shaking. The Furies went on. The man who strikes carelessly hides his bloody hands. If the cries of the dead go unheard in the darkness, he will forget them. Life will become cheap. His blade will be drawn ever easier until none are safe from his brutal will. That is why we are here. Our cries can never be silenced. We are the rage of Clytemnestra, and her rage will never fade until the price is paid for her death. It was at this moment that Orestes broke into frantic speech. I did my duty to avenge my father. My mother's death was commanded by Apollo. Her dream was his omen to me. All of this was his design. The Furies rounded on him, 
Traitor. They all howled, Matricide. The Athenians could barely stand to hear them. Every one seemed to raise the anguished cry of some dead soul from the earth. Step away from him, Athena said firmly. You may not touch Orestes while he is a supplicant of mine. The Furies snarled, but backed away all the same. There was silence. Athena kept watching the Furies closely. In this pause, one of the jurors approached her. Can it be true, Athena? Did your brother Apollo truly command this man to betray his own blood? A voice came from behind them. I commanded the death of Clytemnestra, it said, but this act did not make Orestes a blood traitor. The jury turned. There, striding up the Areopagus toward the assembled crowd, was Apollo. The god was tall and strong, and more radiant and beautiful than any of them had imagined. With his arrival, a dazzling light had spread across the Areopagus. By contrast, the city below, even in sunlight, seemed grey and dull. But Apollo's great glow did not suggest peace and kindness. It shone bright and glorious, and dangerous and merciless all at once. Apollo approached Orestes, whose head was now bowed against the rock. You do not need to cower, young man. You have nothing to be ashamed of. You have redeemed the house of Atreus. Orestes looked up at him, and for the first time he seemed to show signs of hope. The Furies were unmoved by the gods' mighty presence. They surrounded him. It is true, then, Apollo. You gave the order for this man to break the sacred bond the one that holds child and parent, host and guest. You upset the natural order. Men appeal to their gods to raise themselves up to the sky. But men do not live in the sky. Men live upon the earth, and there their actions have consequences. Just like Orestes, you too must learn this lesson. Even you, arrogant gods of Olympus, cannot make your champions immune to the call of fate. Apollo looked down at them scornfully. You are ignorant, backward animals, he said. You would drag humanity back to the caves. The earth gnashes its teeth for the death of Clytemnestra. Where was its rage for the mighty Agamemnon? I alone have to seek satisfaction for the breaking of the most sacred bond between man and wife. Men of Athens began to realize why they had been called here. The justice of heaven and earth did not agree on the fate of this man. For either side to claim him would be an act of war, in a conflict that had been dormant for centuries. So the responsibility had been handed to men, and now their confusion became fear. How could they judge this man without making themselves a lethal enemy? To Apollo they owed music, prophecy, the safety of their livestock, and the skill of their sailors. If they agreed to the execution of his champion, they would invite pestilence, warfare, and destruction. Yet, if the Earth's justice was denied, the rage of the restless dead would howl at the doors of Athens forever. Apollo turned now to Electra. You alone were present when your father was killed, he said. What did you see that night? Electra met his gaze steadily. Those images have never left my mind, she replied. I saw our mother emerge from the palace, covered in blood, our father's blood, and she looked down at it soaking her arms and chest, and she said, O oh, Agamemnon, it seems that you were not so invincible after all. With each strike upon your helpless body, more of your blood sprayed forth and soaked me like the spring rains. 
I revel in it, rejoicing like the dry earth receiving its healing showers. The speech visibly upset Electra, but she went on, now angry. My mother threw herself into the pool of blood that soaks our house, and then she dared to send me to ask my father's rage to rest, as though I would have asked him for that. Now Apollo spoke. Yes, I chose Orestes to bear this wrath of Agamemnon. For what kind of son will not avenge his father? And let me ask you this. To whom does Orestes truly owe his loyalty? Yes, a son should not betray his parent. But who is the true parent, father or mother? Is it not the man's seed that produces the child? The seed of Orestes may have grown within Clytemnestra, but it could have grown anywhere, and Orestes would still be among us today. It is Agamemnon who is responsible for the nature of his son, and to Agamemnon that Orestes owes fealty. After all, your only patron, Athena, was born whole from her father's body. Look upon her and think of mighty Zeus. Do you need any further proof that the child bears its father's nature? The jurors looked at one another. Indeed, it was the wisdom of Zeus that imbued Athena with her keen judgment, her sound guidance for each and every Athenian. This was the foundation upon which Athens was built. Could they have trusted it if it had not come from Zeus, undiluted? The Furies looked angrily at Athena, but the goddess said nothing. And at this, the Furies ceased to restrain themselves. Many shouted, some shrieked, the sound was cacophonous. The mother nurtures the child, one shouted, but was drowned out by another. A fool's tale, nothing but... And even a third caught across that one. Can you truly believe this nonsense about your goddess? And since the jury could no longer hear any of their arguments, Athena called that the trial was at an end. Again and again she cried for silence, until finally the Furies relented. And then Athena turned to the jurors. The time has come, she said. You have heard what these two parties had to say. Now it is for you to decide. Not the Furies as wardens of the earth, not the gods as rulers of the sky. It is for you humans to choose the fate of mortals here. The time has come to cast your votes. The jurors turned to each other to begin their discussion of everything they had heard, but it took them several minutes to find any words at all. A great responsibility had been placed on their shoulders, one that they had not asked for, and most of them barely even understood it. The verdict took a long time to reach. Some of them looked to Athena, hoping for some guidance, but her face was expressionless. It was the only one that was. Apollo and Electra both looked proud and confident. The Furies never took their eyes off Orestes, thinking only of their retribution. Orestes himself was knelt upon the ground, looking up just a little to stare out across the rooftops of Athens. Was this the last day he would see on this earth? After all he had been through, would he die before he sat on the throne of Mycenae? Before he had spent a single day in his home city? Finally, the count was announced. The jury was unanimous. Orestes would not be killed. Though a son should not kill his mother, they said, he was fulfilling a higher duty to his father, his true parent. And so he would be set free, and they hoped the new king of Mycenae would remember the friendship of the city of Athens as long as he lived. And so with the wisdom of Athena, and the sound judgment of the human race, the river of blood that had poured from the house of Atreus, was brought to an end. But there is one final twist in this tale, 
The Furies did not simply lie down and accept their defeat. That night, when Orestes had been led from the city, and the jury had retired to their homes, and the gods had returned to Olympus, the howls began. Imagine the sounds you would hear if all the houses in your town collapsed, and you saw your neighbours knelt before the heaps of rubble, too late to save their loved ones within. Hundreds of these cries, all at once and unrelenting, went up through Athens. An army of snakes swarmed through the streets, searching for victims. The whole city awoke, huddled together and prayed for their safety. Then Athena appeared on the street. Enough, she cried. You have my attention. Let me hear your complaints, Furies, if you have them. So the Furies halted their assault, and slowly they gathered before the goddess. It is too late, Athena, one of them replied. The earth has not fallen silent because of your little play justice. The debt is still unpaid. And if Athens has removed responsibility for this murder from the shoulders of Orestes, then it has taken that responsibility on itself. For Clytemnestra and all those whose murders go unpunished, Athens will be razed to the ground. Please, Athena asked them, listen to reason. If your vicious justice continues, the chain of violence will carry on forever. The blade of judgment falls first from one side, and then the other, in an endless cycle. The Athenians have shown us the way to break this chain. The wisest men will hear complaints from all sides, and then cast the final judgment. If anyone should challenge it, they declare war not just on one man, but on all their people. Two furies advanced upon her. Tell us. Why is it Athena? One of them asked. In this perfect new world, what good does it do a mother to be judged by men who believe they can birth children from their own heads? How dare you, Athena? The other snarled. How dare you forget what Zeus did to your mother? Beneath her helmet, her face darkened in rage. Never dare to speak for me. I am Athena, daughter of Zeus. If you strike my city, you will soon remember that I have bested the god of war upon the battlefield. Myself and all the gods of broad heaven will line up against you. You wish for our answer? We will crush you under our heels. Some of the Furies laughed. The Earth's rage cannot be threatened, Athena. We exist to avenge. No death or destruction can persuade us until we have squeezed justice from the bones of Athens. But Athena was not done. No. After today, she said, who will rally to your cause? On whose side are you fighting? The judgment of men has chosen allegiance to the gods. And those women, those mothers whose fate you so bemoan, will they pray for your victory when you have begun to slaughter their sons? You know that this war you propose is a war against all the living, as well as the gods, and it is a war you cannot win. Do the fallen cry for a blaze of futile glory? The dead still have another choice. Their complaints can be heard in these trials, if you will be their voice. Think it over. What do the dead call you to do? The Furies went silent. They were seething, for they knew that they had been outwitted. Finally, one of them spoke. We will not forget this betrayal. The Earth will remember how the gods of Olympus perverted the rules of the natural world. To make families where the sons owe nothing to their mothers. We can wait for them. Your laws may bind up the souls of humanity for now. Your houses and kingdoms may stick shut the mouths that want to scream. 
The laws do not last forever, and neither do nations. Men still live their lives upon the earth, and sooner or later, its demands upon them will win. And yet for all these words, the Furies withdrew from the city without a drop of bloodshed. And so, by the wisdom of Athena, Athens was spared and the torch of justice was passed. The Birth of Serpents recounts one of the most infamously bloody cycles in Greek mythology, the myths of the House of Atreus, and it's based largely on the trilogy of plays by the Athenian tragedian Aeschylus, known as the Oresteia. The myths that follow the stories about the siege of Troy and its fall are often known as the Returns, and they told the stories of the different kings and heroes and their fates as they travelled back from Troy to their homes. At Troy, they offended the gods by committing various sacrileges after the fall of the city. While the Odyssey is the most famous example of a return narrative, stories were also told about the journeys of Nestor, Menelaus and Helen, and Agamemnon, the Greek war leader. Agamemnon's fate was the most bloody because he was murdered by his wife, Clytemnestra. The motivations for the murder were ostensibly the sacrifice of Clytemnestra's daughter, Iphigenia, which was demanded by the gods before Agamemnon could sail to Troy, although many people claimed that she was using this as an excuse for more selfish motivations. The murder sparked the next cycle of the story in which Agamemnon and Clytemnestra's son, Orestes, was driven to revenge himself on his mother at the behest of Apollo. In different accounts, Orestes' sister, Electra, was also motivated to call for and aid in the killing of her mother. While these stories are related in several places in Greek sources, the most famous depiction is undoubtedly Aeschylus's Orestia. And these three plays included Agamemnon, which depicted the murder of the war leader, the Libation Bearers, which told of Orestes' return and murder of his mother, and the Eumenides, in which Orestes was pursued by the Furies and sought sanction and vindication for his act of revenge from the Olympian gods. The trilogy explored the demands and consequences of different types or conceptions of justice. There was justice by the laws of vengeance, upheld by the ancient and primal gods, which kept the house of Atreus enmeshed in a web of bloody revenge and retaliation. And then there was justice through law, symbolically introduced in these plays to society through Athena, representing the Olympian gods as the new standard by which to judge the actions of Orestes. This argument was intimately bound up with the culture of Aeschylus' city Athens, celebrating and promoting its own institutions of law. In the plays, and in the mythology, the Erinyes or Furies represented the law of retribution and its basis in loyalty to family, blood and kinship. They emerged from the underworld principally to punish parricide, the killing of one's blood and kin, but also sins against others and oath-breaking. There were sometimes said to be many Furies, but other times there were said to be three principal Furies, Electo, Megira and Tisiphone, who were the children of Uranus. Descriptions and depictions of the Furies as creatures varied. They were sometimes described as crones, sometimes as having snakes for hair, or as having dogs' heads, as having coal-black bodies, or bats' wings. The Furies were said to be known by different names according to their roles in different realms. They were the Eumenides in the underworld, where they received people's oaths and prayers and judged people, and the Erinyes on Earth, where they carried scourges which they used to torment their victims, pursuing them across the Earth until their deaths. 
The torments inflicted on victims by the Furies were often described and depicted as psychological phenomenon, closely related to experiences of madness, of hallucination, and of nightmares and dreams. In one fascinating scene in the Eumenides, the shade of Clytemnestra appears not to Orestes, but to the Furies themselves in the form of a dream, where she upbraids them to wake and carry on the persecution of her son. Eumenides meant kindly ones, and it was a euphemistic name for talking about the Furies without and it was a euphemistic name for talking about the Furies without invoking their true name and nature and accidentally drawing their attention. The Romans later called the Furies the Dirie, and one Roman of claimed that this was their name in heaven. In Aeschylus's play, the assertion of the law of justice over that of retribution is represented by a negotiation in which Athena persuades the Furies to defend the new Olympian order of justice and to become known as the Semnie or Ancient Ones rather than as the Furies. And Athens itself had a temple to the Eumenides. Seen through the prism of Orestes' conflicting duties towards his father and his mother, the law of vengeance here was being depicted as a biological and even matriarchal imperative in conflict with laws based on deliberative reasoning and lawmaking, which were identified as being rational and masculine. This embodied one of the central conceits of the Greek patriarchal conception of society, in which women were believed to act from passion and emotion and men from reason and forethought. But as evidenced by the ruling of Athena and the court in the play, this rational judgment essentially amounted to affirming the priority and status of men through laws and institutions which were of course created and controlled by men. Orestes' act of vengeance is excused because he owes loyalty first to his father and not to his mother. It may appear ironic that it is Athena and not Zeus who represents the Olympians here, but this was a way of bolstering the patriarchal ideology. Athena was often described as embodying or possessing masculine characteristics and virtues, in some sense different and by implication superior to other women because of this. Symbolically, she was born out of Zeus's head, and that leads her to make a claim that she has not been nurtured by her mother. Her wisdom, power and status are therefore derived principally from her direct allegiance to and service to her father, Zeus. Athena states she can't give primacy to the rights of a mother when she herself does not have one. But in this episode, the Furies remind her that Athena did have a mother, Metis, who was pregnant with her before she was swallowed up and consumed by Zeus, only later to pop up out of his head. Orestes is front and centre in the narratives presented by Homer and Aeschylus, but the Greek playwrights in particular were also eager to explore the role of his sister Electra in the myth, and how a daughter might be expected to act in the same situation. Was the law of vengeance binding on her as well, and did they owe more to their own mother or father? In Aeschylus's tale, Electra is an ally to her brother, but is ultimately a passive character who waits for the hero to return and exact divine vengeance because that is his role. Sophocles' play seems to depict a struggle within Electra to decide whether revenge really is a form of justice. She believes that her mother has used the excuse of justice to enact her own selfish desires, and yet she herself is unable to restrain her own desire to see her mother suffer at the hands of her brother. Euripides' play Electra and its portrayal of her and her brother was subversively anti-heroic. Their acts of revenge spurred by some selfish motivations, their character and actions were not particularly heroic, and their victims were also shown to be capable of self-reflection, regret and repentance, all of which called into question the virtue of revenge. In the first two plays, Electra accepts that it is men like Orestes who are expected to seek and carry out revenge, and there is an implied rejection of the character and motivations of her mother who took revenge into her own hands. Only Euripides directly implicates Electra in the murder of her mother, 
as her own hand guides Orestes' sword as he pushes it into her chest. Next week, Odysseus matches wits with Palamedes, one of the warlord Agamemnon's most skillful generals on the fields of Troy. You've been listening to Lore and Legend, The Gates of Dream, Episode 9, The Birth of Serpents. Our story today was interpreted and performed by Sebastian O'Dell. This episode featured music by Michael Levy and Sakilo. Additional sounds and music were sourced from the community at freesound.org. Full audio credits are available on our website. For news about upcoming episodes and more info about our stories and their sources in world folklore, you can find us at www.loreandlegend.co.uk and you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter by searching for at of law and legend. If you like what you hear and you would like to keep on hearing more, then please do consider supporting the podcast with a one-time contribution through Ko-Fi or by supporting us regularly as a patron. You can find details on how to do that on our website. So once again, safe journeys, sweet dreams, and thank you for listening, Story Folk.